with me. I want to bless you. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Pastor Larry Huggins, as most of you know. This is Summit, and uh, we do a couple of things here. We have a real good time, a lot of fun, fellowshipping around the things of God, and uh, we enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's a charismatic service. It's not maybe a full-blown Pentecostal hoedown, but the Holy Spirit moves here. And I'm waiting on that full, full-blown full hallelujah hoedown to, to happen to us one night. It might happen. Art here might run around the church, jump over some chairs. I don't know. It could happen. Amen. I can only imagine. And then we study, um, we study the Pauline revelation, that is, who we are in Christ. This is the mystery that was hidden for the ages, but now is revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. For a lot of people, Jesus is far off, and one day, if we're good, when we die, we'll meet him. But you and I have stepped into Jesus. Here's the gospel, not just that we can invite him into our life, but he has invited us into his life. Praise God. That is that is the revelation of revelations. So we, uh, we welcome you tonight. I want you to stretch your hands up towards heaven. I want to bless you. Father, I thank you for baptizing every single person here with the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge and the epinosis of Jesus. Give each one of us a further revelation of Jesus. Not history's Jesus, not Hollywood's Jesus, not even religion. Jesus, but the real, right here, right now, resurrected Jesus. Open our eyes to see Jesus. Open our hearts to see Jesus, I pray. And may everyone here have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to comprehend what you're giving us tonight through your word and by your spirit in Jesus' name. Now you get to pray for me. So stretch your hands out here and just pray that God will use me. Father, I thank you that I didn't call myself. You called me. I haven't sent myself, you sent me. I'm not here because I've equipped myself, but because you have equipped me to serve you in your kingdom. And whatever gifts and graces or spiritual endowments you wish to release through my vessel to bless these, your people, I'll do my best to yield to you and I'll be the first one to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, one more hand clap to the Lord. Clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Praise his holy name. Jesus is Lord. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, Alleluia. Well, you're looking extraordinarily good tonight, and uh, I can feel everybody's on. You came out with your expector turned on, so uh, sit down and fasten your seatbelt. God's got some good things for you. Man, I have had a good time in church today. It, it was so great. We had a good turnout for people signing up for JServe. Everybody was really happy. And uh, you're going to see some new people serving in different areas. How many here, maybe you, you're here tonight and you signed up for something in JSERV? Good. Give them a hand clap. Praise the Lord. And I don't know. I just especially enjoyed today. I enjoy every Sunday at Jubilee, but I really enjoyed today. We had communion. Preacher preached a good message. I enjoyed Pastor Dick preaching. Uh, only my wife kept elbowing me and squeezing me every time he said husbands need to learn how to listen to their wives. I got elbowed. I told Pastor Dick, I said, I have a bone to pick with you, man. My arm's sore. I said, I got the whipping that somebody else deserved. I don't know. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, uh, we got some scripture for you to look at, and we're going to have a uh, we're going to have a good time here in the Lord. Let me open up my my phone, and uh, get on the first page here. Here we go. All right, uh, George, let's put 1 Peter 2.5 up on the screen. You also as lively stones, that's uh, King James for living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The word acceptable means uh, to be received ceremoniously. You and I were created by God to offer up sacrifices that are acceptable into God. In other words, that have a sweet aroma to them, something that God will be pleased with. But the point I want to make out is that you and I are living stones, and together we make up a tabernacle for God to inhabit. 
God does not inhabit buildings made of stones. He dwells among his people. And you and I are building blocks in the temple of God, the habitation of God. Now, in Babel, in the Old Testament, they built a tower that was made of brick. But in the New Testament, we see God building his habitation, not with brick, but with living stones. Bricks are uniform. Bricks are cast out of the same mold. Each brick has the same shape and the same weight and the same dimensions, and a brick can easily be replaced by another brick. If a brick is broken or damaged, it can be tossed aside. Uh, when I was young, I worked as a bricklayer's assistant or helper. That's hard work, and I know about bricks. And then later on in life, uh, I became a stonemason, and we built with native stones, stones of different shapes, just the stones that we would harvest right out of some outcrop of rock. On the, uh, In fact, we would do that. We would go out to farms and ranches, pay the farmer, the rancher money by the ton for rocks. Then we'd harvest those rocks. It's hard work. Load them on a truck and then take them to the job site, offload them, and then start, uh, you know, building walls with these stones. Now, religion, I, I think this is analogous, this, this Babel is analogous to man's religion. Have you noticed that people who are religious, people who get caught up in religious functions and religious organizations start to look alike, walk alike, talk alike, and sound alike. It's almost as though they are clones. And, and there's no uh, allowance for any individuality, for any variation. As I look around this room, I'm seeing all kinds of shapes and sizes and hues and tints and colors and personalities of people. You are not a brick. You are a living stone. You got your own shape. You got your own lie. You got a place where you fit. I used to really enjoy doing the, the stonework because it was like putting a big puzzle together. You'd have a hole and you'd want to fill it, so you'd go around looking. If it was a triangle-shaped hole, you'd look for a triangle-shaped rock. That makes sense, doesn't it? It? Or if it was kind of a roundish hole, you'd look for a roundish uh, rock to fill that hole and something the, the right size, and you fit all these together, and uh, it doesn't look like brick where everything is on the same course and, and, you know, just boringly uniform. Not that I'm against brick, but God has a place for you, and he knows where to fit you, and once you get into God's building, it's going to bring integrity and strength to that building. God can use you just as you are, knots and warts and all. Amen? It's all right to give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. You are living stones, building together, a habitation for God's Spirit. You know, all of us kind of wonder uh, where we fit, where we fit in. Well, God has a place for each and every person. And I, I'm amazed at how God can get people plugged in to his house. And he's got, uh, he's got just that very, very special place for you. Uh, now let's continue. Ephesians 2.21, here is an in him scripture. And those of you who study with me know that an in him scripture is a, is a scripture usually found in the New Testament that tells us something of who we are, what we have, and what we can do by virtue of our divine union with Christ. That's kind of our mantra around here. We, we repeat that over and over. Ephesians 2, 21. In whom, I could say in Christ, in Jesus, all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple. You see how this relates to 1 Peter 2, 5? The building fitly framed grows together into a holy temple of the Lord in whom, or in Christ, in Jesus, ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Here's what God wants. God wants to put us together in such a way that he can manifest among us. God wants to organize us in such a way that the Holy Spirit and the glory of God can manifest in our midst. He wants us to be together in such a way that the gifts of the Spirit will flow freely. 
that miracles will happen. God has a pattern or an idea for his church, and what he desires is a supernatural church. He doesn't want us to be a bunch of Christianettes listening to sermonettes. He wants us to be living stones in his house, and he wants us to function for him and to become a body that he can manifest in, among, and through. Praise God. I'm always thinking about that when I think about the church, when I, especially when I think about Summit, is how that God, by His Spirit, every time we get together, is doing things to fit us into His spiritual house. When we look at the church, don't look at these walls, don't look at these buildings. That's not what makes a church a church. I'm very grateful that we're indoors and we're not outdoors where it's raining tonight and cold. I'm very grateful that we have padded chairs to sit on and that we have electric lights. I've had church many times without any of those things. I have preached under the open sky. I have preached under pendals. That's what we call them in India, which is just a shade made out of palm leaves above our heads. Uh, it's kind of what in Arkansas we called a brush arbor. I preached under brush arbors where you get some posts and string some, some you know, wood across the top of it, branches and things, and heap branches up. And all it does is keep uh, the sun off you. It provides a little shade. And in the evening, it keeps the dew or the moisture off of us. They call it a brush arbor. You may have heard old-timey time, preachers preaching, talking about how they preached under a brush arbor. Well, you're looking at one right here. I've preached under a brush arbor. I've preached under tents. I've preached on boats. I've preached in a worm farm once. I've preached in bars. I've preached in warehouses. I've preached in a shoe factory. Uh, I like to get together with preachers, and we all start bragging about where we preached. I usually beat all of them because I have preached in some of the strangest places, and I found out something, that God can move and manifest anywhere. He does not need marble floors. He does not need a vaulted ceiling. All he needs is his people to come together in unity and in faith and allow him to move through them. Praise the Lord. You and I comprise the church not the building. We are a building within a building. We are the habitation of God's Spirit, and He is pulling, putting us together in such a way that He can do amazing things with us and through us. Another scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Paul is talking about himself here. He's using a, um, a pronoun that we call the majestic we. When he says we are ambassadors for Christ, he's talking about himself, not plural. He's, he's speaking on behalf of God and the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like, you know, the king or the queen uses that same vernacular when they say we have determined and we think it well and we have decreed. They're not talking about some consensus. They're saying that God in us has decided on your behalf we're going to do that. So Paul is talking about himself here when he says we. He's talking about his ministry gift. We are laborers together with God. We're working with God. We're in a partnership with God. We're doing something for God. And you are God's husbandry. In other words, you're something that God is manufacturing or doing. And you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds their own, but let every man take heed how he builds their own, for no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. George, let's keep going. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, keep going, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. I think we have one more verse. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive his reward. I like that term, Paul said, as a wise master builder. The Greek word there is architecton. That's a compound word. Arch means the, the top or the highest level. Tecton means... Um, uh, and. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Artisan. It's where we get the word ar architect, architecton, architect. 
architecton. And the Apostle Paul said, I'm the architect. I'm working with God in God's building, and my job description is I am an architect. You know, there was an architect that designed this building. There was an architect that designed that building. In fact, all of these buildings in the Bay Area that you've seen have some highly skilled architects who drew out the plans, and those plans had to be in compliance with the laws and with safety regulations, had to be signed off on, and then the builders came and followed the plan. God has a plan. He's not just doing things randomly. He's not just throwing a bunch of rubble together and calling it something. He has a plan for his church, and the Apostle Paul said, I'm working with God in his building, and he's made me an architect. And he said, I have laid the foundation and let everybody be careful how he or she builds upon that foundation. I want to talk to you about your foundation. Now, knowing Paul through his writings in Scripture, I know what he means by when he, when he says, I've laid a foundation. It's not the only time he uses that phrase. He talks a lot about the foundation. And that's Paul speak for the death, burial, resurrection, and substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. In other words, it's Paul talking about the in him truth or the in him reality. It's Paul describing what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Praise the Lord. And he said, this is how I build every church. I come in and I lay the foundation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, that's not the foundation for every church. Some churches are built solely upon the music ministry and the sound and the look and the feel. Some churches are built entirely upon their social programs. Some churches are built upon, you know, what they do in the community. Nothing that I just mentioned is wrong, but those things are not the foundation. The foundation is the revelation of the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus and what he accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah. And you got to get that foundation under you. We can't build on programs. We can't build on, on social issues. We can't build upon um, current events. And one of the buzzwords among preachers is, is uh, you know, relevant things. We've got to be relevant. And they start talking about being politically correct and knowing all the buzzwords and, and being able to identify where the millennials are and where the X generation is and all this and give them what they want. One preacher said to me, we need to give the young people what they want. I said, they want sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Where are you going to stop? <laughs> you don't give them what you want. You build a foundation under them so that when the wind blows, they're not going to fall. And when the ground moves, they're going to not move. You know, Jesus said, a foolish man builds his house on the sand. And when the wind and storm comes, the house falls. But a wise man builds upon the rock. And when the wind comes and the waves come, that house will not fall because it's built upon the rock. We're talking about becoming unshakable Christians, unmovable Christians, Christians that can weather the storm, whether it's a storm of life or a storm of culture or a political storm or an economic storm. God wants you to be unshakable. Now, if you've, if you've been paying attention to me, I am an arch tecton. I wouldn't put myself in the category of Paul, but um, my background is not engineer, engineering, it's not architecture, it's fine arts, I'm a sculptor. But sculpture has to be, have engineering involved. It has to be strong, it has to be stable, it has to be something enduring. I don't wanna put all my effort into something that's gonna crumble or going to fall, so when I'm building something, I make sure that the armature is strong, that the foundation and the base is strong, so that whatever I build is gonna pass the test of time. I understand the importance of having a strong foundation. And when I look at you, and when I see your future, and, and anticipating what's going to come into your life, then I know that I need to help you build a strong foundation in your Christian walk. I just don't want to tickle your fancy. I don't want to just talk about something that's going to be current, you know, the latest whatever. There are a lot of fads in Christianity. I want to give you the stuff that's going to pass the test of time. I want to help you with something that's going to make you strong during times of adversity, and no matter what 
comes your way, you're going to be intact because you're not built upon shifting sand. You're built upon the solid rock of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? The first six months of these summit meetings, all I talked about every night, every night was in him, in him, in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, by whom. And I'm still on that and I'm gonna stay with it because the more you get this into your spirit, the more you renew your mind within him truth, the more rock solid you're going to be. This is the foundation. And people say, well, I wanna learn about the gifts of the spirit. I'm gonna teach you about the gifts of the spirit, but if you don't get a foundation, you're gonna be a flaky Christian. I know a lot of spooky, flaky Christians, and oh, they're being led by this and they're being led by that. Let me tell you something. The Holy Ghost is not going to lead you contrary to the rock-solid Word of God. He is going to bear witness of the Word. And so the stronger you get, the more fit you will be for the Holy Spirit to use you. You're not going to be blown around by winds of doctrines and all that stuff. Every few years, there's something happens in the world some comet or some tidal wave or some earthquake. And it's amazing to me how it's the Christians that are always uh, predicting doom and gloom and running around like Chicken Little with his head cut off saying, what are we gonna do? The end is near. If you're really a born again, spirit filled Christian, you're not worried about the end because your life is hid with Christ in God and you're not appointed unto wrath but to obtain salvation by Jesus Christ. Let me think back. I remember Comet Kohotek back in 1975, I think it was. There was some comet going around the earth and all the flaky prophets predicted that God was going to destroy the United States of America by fire and brimstone. Goofy. <laughs> then there was the Jupiter effect. All the planets were gonna line up and the tidal forces, the gravita combined gravitational forces of Jupiter and Mars and Uranus and all that kind of stuff was going to pull the earth apart into fragments. These are Christians predicting this stuff. How many of you are old enough to remember Y2K at the turn of the millennium when all the computers are gonna stop and civilization's going to cease and hungry, marauding clouds of, crowds of zombies are gonna start taking over, eating flesh and God knows what? <laughs> I, I could probably go through 17 of these weird prophecies that happen every couple of years. And let me tell you something. I'm, I'm going to brag on Jesus for a little bit. It never moved me one iota. I never got caught up in any of the hysteria. I was the voice of reason. Just settle down. It's all going to pan out. It's all going to be okay. God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation. And when people are hysterical, they don't want to hear something like that. They want to go on the internet and, and go to some prophetic website and listen to all the prophets of doom and gloom. I don't know why people would climb up in a tree to listen to an idiot when they could stand flat-footed on the ground and listen to their pastor. Praise the Lord. That went over real big. That was kind of a, that was kind of a weak hand clap. I want you to know right there. Amen. All right. Let's look at the last part of that. Now, if any man built upon this foundation, you have to lay the foundation first. And I, I say this again, that foundation is the revelation of Christ in you. That's the foundation. And you can't spend too much time on it. You may get bored. I try to keep this from being boring. How many of you ever gotten bored in Summit? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I mean, if you start to get bored, I'd do hands, you know, uh, flips or something. I don't want you to get bored. But I am going to stay on this in him stuff until Jesus comes back. Paul spent his whole life doing it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend my life doing it too because I know what helps people. So when you're building on the foundation, we have to make sure it's gold, silver, and precious stones, not wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble are things that can be burned. Gold, silver, and precious gems are those things which cannot be burned. Let me tell you an interesting family history. I've got some, I've got some amazing relatives. I'll tell you about Aunt Peggy and Uncle Rowden. 
They were interesting, to say the least. Aunt Peggy was a beautiful young woman. She grew up in poverty during the Depression. And she traded on her good looks. She was stunning. She looked like Elizabeth Taylor. And just amazing. Had this auburn hair and, you know, beautiful full lips and a full figure. And, and uh, she kind of married money. She married someone she thought could make her rich. His name was Jack Masters. And Jack had a knack for making money, but it wasn't enough for Peggy. And she had a hot temper, you know, red-haired, Irish temper. And uh, she got mad at Jack in El Paso, Texas, kicked him out of the car, and he had to hitchhike to Dallas. And by the time he got there, the marriage was over. So she married Mr. Rowden. Mr. Rowden was an entrepreneur. He bought and sold properties and businesses, and, and they were rolling high for a number of years. I remember as a kid that uh, one Christmas we went to their house and I thought it was a castle. It had an elevator in it. It was four stories high and it had a basement. It had a big tower like on a castle. And I had never been in a house that big. These people had, obviously, had money. They had the big Cadillacs and all that kind of stuff. And their house was filled with all kinds of precious things. And, and she was a person who, uh, her, her, her love language was giving gifts. But when she got mad at you, she'd ask for the gift back. So you better, not, you better not throw it away or sell it because sooner or later, she's going to ask for it back. So if, if Peggy gave us anything, we just put it in the closet and waited because <laughs> she's going to get mad and she's going to reclaim it. I worked for my Aunt Peggy one summer, and I could write a book about it. It was the most amazing summer of my life, just Amazing being with these two characters. At that time, they were kind of on the downside of life. They were getting older and their fortunes had disappeared. OS bought an estate on a private lake. I say a private lake. There were about five families who lived on this lake. And that was it. And they were... They were pretty big estates. Some had horses, you know, like uh, thoroughbred horses. Aunt Peggy never had children, so she had a menagerie of animals. She had llamas, or as we say in South America, llamas. You know, bacuña, llama, what do you call those other things? Alpaca, alpaca. And she had Angora goats, the ones that had the real long Angora. She just got them because they were beautiful. She had peacock with the beautiful feathers. And she had guinea fowl. And she had all kinds of fowl. She, she raised the, these different kinds of chickens that had, they were, they were for show. They had beautiful plumage and feathers and everything. She had hundreds of cats. She had dogs. She had standard poodles. She had uh, Arabian horses. She had, I mean, I just can't go through all this stuff. And um, I remember as a, as a youngster, about 13 maybe, my, my mother and father and I driving to their place. She and my dad got into a terrible row. They didn't speak for years, and they were trying to mend that relationship. And I remember my parents saying to me, Dear God, Larry, don't touch anything. Don't run in the house. Don't slam the door. They're giving me a whole list of things to do. And uh, man, it was impressive from, from the get-go. We drove up to these big columns of stone with iron gates, and there was an intercom. And you press the button, and they talked to you from the main house, and the gates opened up. And we drove on this pea gravel driveway that went past all of these animals. They had a greenhouse with exotic plants, orchids, and things like that. Down on the lake was a big boathouse. They had a Chris Craft cruiser in there, a beautiful boat. They didn't just have a house. It was a log mansion. It looked like something that, uh, you know, a ski uh, lodge up in Colorado. It, it had a 40-foot atrium on the inside of it and a balcony, a fireplace you could drive a Volkswagen into. And they had stables and they had tack room and they had a carriage house and they had rooms out there for their servants. And uh, this place was impressive. And you it went inside and it's like being in a museum. They had all these things. They had collected heirlooms and porcelain and silver and gold. And she collected a lot of jewelry. 
Uh, all of her life, she hated being poor, and so she collected things, material things. And she gave us a tour, and she opened up all of her jewelry boxes, and she explained where she got each and every piece of jewelry. And she showed us all these antiques and things, and gave us the story behind it. That was my Aunt Peggy. In a few years from then, they were sleeping, no children, they just had pets. And they were on the second floor, which opened up onto a, a balcony, which overlooked the main living area, which was huge, big as a basketball court. And my uncle Rowden heard something, and he opened the door, and he witnessed an inferno. The place was on fire. That big, beautiful fireplace had caught some drapes and rugs on fire. It's a log house with a lot of varnish on it, and it is going up in flames. He slammed the door. They took the dogs and threw them out of the second floor window onto the roof of the kitchen. Then they climbed out in their underwear. Now, they're both big people. Routon as big as I am and outweighs me by 100 pounds, and, and Peggy was almost as big as he was. She's a big old gal, as we say in Texas. And they walked across the roof of the kitchen and they climbed down a tree and Peggy got down first and then round and slipped and went inverted, caught his ankle, his foot in a fork of that tree. This house is a huge bonfire. The, the flames are getting closer to him. Peggy's filled with adrenaline. She lifts Rowden up all 350 pounds of him, got him loose and they backed away from the fire and the little volunteer fire department, by the time they got there, it was over. This thing went up like a tender, it was a tender box. And here's Peggy and Rowden in their underwear, in the rain, it's misting rain, it's wintertime, they're shivering. Neighbors came, the volunteer fire department came, and they put some blankets around them. Later on, they went to the, some people went to town and got them some clothes. They lost everything. Rowden had been a good businessman, but because of cash flow problems, he had let his insurance expire. There was not one cent of insurance on the entire place. It was a total loss. They lost everything. And with it, they lost their minds. The summer I went to work for them, they owned a little cheap hotel. They were trying to build it up to sell it because that's what they did. And Peggy had gotten bigger and bigger let herself go. She had this old Cadillac convertible and she would put on these Toreador pants. I mean, before they had yoga pants and leggings, they had Toreador pants. And with knee-high boots with stiletto heels, <laughs> I'm trying to paint a picture for you. Here's a 300-pound woman in Toreador pants and stiletto boots. She has no eyebrows, so she paints eyebrows on her forehead kind of high. Cupid's bow lipstick, you know, where the lipstick goes off the lips, too much rouge, too much jewelry, a bunch of cheap costume jewelry. And she'd want me to drive her around to different places. One place we'd drive to is where the old house was, and it was a pile of ashes. And she and Rowden would go out there with rakes and sticks and sift through the ashes. And every now and then, they would find a little melted globule of silver or gold. It might even have a a precious stone in it that had been ruined by the fire. And they'd pick up those little fragments. And she had a big ragged silk scarf and she'd put them in the scarf and tie a knot and stick it in this purse that's the size of a suitcase. And what she liked doing, since they didn't have any money to spend, was go to the flea markets. And she'd have me drive her. I was driving Miss Daisy all summer long. She was a character. She would, she would encourage me to go as fast as I can. I'd say, Aunt Peggy, I'm going the speed limit. She'd put her stiletto boot on my foot and push the accelerator to the floor, and she said, you drive, and I'll look for the cops. And, and you know, a 17-year-old kid, I didn't mind this too much. Here I am in this old Cadillac convertible tearing down these back roads of East Texas with this crazy woman in the car and, and she dyed her hair bright red and you know, it, it was an amazing sight and we're going down through there. She'd be just talking nonsense the whole time and, and, and she would stop 
at these flea markets. She'd say, there, pull over right there. And I knew what was going to happen. She would always turn the conversation and let people know that she used to be rich. And I used to, and she'd describe the house. I used to have this house and describe her life. And then she'd start digging through her purse to prove to them that she wasn't lying. And I would walk away in shame because I knew what she was going to do. She'd pull out that silk scarf with a half ounce or an ounce of melted silver and gold fused together. And she'd say, look, I used to be rich. That was all she had to show for a lifetime of collecting and hoarding. When she died, she lived in a one-room house. She didn't have a stove or a heater. She had a hot plate. It warmed the place. She cooked on it, made her coffee on it. She got even bigger, diabetic. The county would send a nurse over to give her the insulin shots, and my Aunt Peggy would cuss her when she came in the door. Get away from me. That made such an impression on me when I was young, how that a person's life can go up in smoke, how a person's life can go up in flames. And I decided early on that I'm not going to put my trust in cattle or silver or gold. I'm not against those things, but I'm going to put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Paul said, there's coming a shaking when heaven and earth will shake so that everything that can be shaken, so that things that can't be shaken will remain. And this I can prophesy to you, at some point in your life, you're going to experience some loss. At some time in your life, you're going to experience some disappointment. At some time, people are going to let you down. At some time, someone's going to betray you. At some time, some leader is going to disappoint you. At some time, maybe your riches won't be there, or maybe people won't be there, but if you have a foundation of Jesus Christ in your life, you're not going to be shaken. Everything else can be shaken, but you're not going to be shaken. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God we have received a kingdom that cannot be moved. I hope the economy keeps climbing. I hope Americans keep becoming more prosperous. But let me tell you something. Whether the stock market is up or whether the stock market is down, you are secure in Jesus Christ. Put your trust in him. Sickness shakes some people up. Death shakes some people up. Disappointment, betrayal, divorce shakes some people up. But if you're shook up, shook up, that's because you have misplaced your trust. I want to encourage you. I want to implore you. I want to beg you. Put your trust in Jesus. If you put your trust in Jesus, you're not going to be confounded. If you put your trust in Jesus, you're not going to be disappointed. My wife and I were in Tulsa, Oklahoma a few years ago, and we saw a young man, a friend of mine from India, actually. We hadn't seen him in a number of years. And he was so excited, he ran into us in a restaurant. He said, could you please sit and talk with us for a minute? And he started telling us a story, and he began to shake and he began to weep, and he couldn't get the words out, and we're thinking, my God, what is the tragedy to ha that happened to him? Remember that? And, and, and he told us how he had been in this state for over 20 years, that he couldn't sleep, his ministry had come to a halt, and nothing was working right, and, and we thought, well, what is this tragedy? And here's what it came down to. There was, there were, there was a church in town that he was a part of, Another minister started a second church about 10 miles away. And this man called the headquarters of the church this other pastor built and asked the head of that denomination if he would stop 
that pastor from building a church. I don't know if you're following this. And the head of the denomination, little denomination, said no. We can build anywhere we want to. You know, it's a big town. It can hold more than one church. And he said, I can't believe that this fellow didn't have any more integrity than I can't believe he had disappointed me so. I can't believe he, he let me down. I'm thinking, dear God, son, that kind of stuff happens to me before breakfast every day. <laughs> I, I, was, I was thinking he was going to tell me that, you know, his wife was in jail for murder or something. I don't know. I mean, it was just had to be terrible. It had to be unimaginable. And it turns out it's, it was such a lightweight deal. But he did not have the ability to focus on Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus has already been through more than you and I will ever go through. And his victory is your victory. His resurrection is your resurrection. His ascension is your ascension. His power is your power. His authority is your authority. His wisdom is your wisdom. Let's make sure that we build our foundation on Jesus Christ and not on current events, not on social relevancy, not on other people. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right here, but if we start misplacing our confidence and putting our confidence in people, say a religious leader or a political leader, I believe God will allow us to be disappointed because he does not want us to trust in men. He wants us to trust in him and his word. Praise God. You've been around a while. You know that every now and then uh, uh, we'll hear some bad news about some preacher somewhere that had a moral failure or, did something they shouldn't have done, even something illegal. And it's amazing how people say, well, I, when I heard about that, I just gave up on God and I quit. Honey, I don't care if they go to hell. I'm not quitting on Jesus Christ. I don't care what they do, what they say. It's not going to affect me. I hope, I pray that nothing bad happens, but it's not going to get me to take my trust off of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to let anyone shake me up. I'm not going to let anything shake me up. Hell or high water or taxes is not going to shake me up. Republicans are not going to shake me up. Democrats are not going to shake me up. Fake news is not going to shake me up. Global warming is not going to shake me up. There ain't nothing going to shake me up because I'm built on an unshakable foundation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and that's where you need to put your trust. I'm amazed that people are just walking around like chicken little prophesying that the sky is falling because of something they read on the internet or something they saw on cable TV. That is not even a speed bump on the road to glory. I'm from Texas. You know what we say about stuff like that? In a hundred years, who's gonna know? <laughs> That's how we talk down there. Not a hundred, a hundred. <laughs> who's gonna know? Who's gonna care? Honey, the shelf life on this stuff isn't even two years. It used to be that these cycles happen like every 10 years. We talked about the decades of the 50s and the decades of the 60s. Have you noticed that those cycles have gotten smaller and smaller till finally the cycle is like a week? <laughs> you know, it's yesterday's pizza, man. Whatever we're excited about today is going to change by the next news cycle, and if we react to all of that, our emotions are gonna be up and down and up and down, and we're gonna be yo-yo Christians who are up one day and down the next. We're gonna be happy one day and sad the next. We're gonna feel okay one day, and we're not gonna feel good at all the next. And you know what the, the reason for that is? I've already told you, misplaced trust. If you trust in the Lord, you will not be confounded. If you've been confounded, that is a clue that you need to work on your foundation. If you've been upset, that's a clue you need to work on your foundation. If you've been shaken by what you've heard or what you've seen or what people have done, that is an indicator that you need 
to go back and work on the basics, to work on the foundation. And that's my job as a wise master builder. I'm here to make sure you have every opportunity to build a foundation under you so that you can build out of gold and silver and precious stones. And when the shaking comes, you ain't gonna be shaken. And when the fire comes, you're not gonna be burned up. Hallelujah. Let me hear a hallelujah from somebody in this Holy Ghost Church. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why don't you stand up with me? I'm going to ask John and his team to come back up. Unshakable. I've lived with earthquakes most of my life. We here in California, that's not anything unusual. I lived in South America in Peru when I was a teenager, and we had them every day. Very active region, seismically. One night I was out near the beach with some of my friends in a little seaport town called Elo. And we're just standing talking. We're behind an outdoor theater. We didn't have an indoor theater. It's just an outdoor theater. And uh, we're looking down this stretch of beach that's probably uh, half a mile wide and as far as the eye can see, right down looking north up the coast of the Pacific coast of Peru. And we hear a rumbling. It sounds like rolling thunder, a rumbling sound. And so we stopped talking and we started looking around and someone asked the question, what is that? And I said, I believe we're having an earthquake. I was the first one to catch on. And as we're looking in the distance, the horizon got kind of fuzzy because the ground was shaking and a little bit of dust was getting airborne because the ground was moving. And the telephone poles, there was a line of telephone poles, began to sway back and forth and the wires began to flop up and down. And we could actually see the seismic waves coming up the beach. We could see them. You know how you look at the water and you can see waves rolling in? Well, because this was a straight stretch, we could actually see the ground rise and fall as this seismic wave was moving through the ground. It was so interesting because when it got to us, these waves would raise us up just like you were standing on a waterbed. If you can imagine that, we'd get raised up and back down and raised up and back. It was actually fun. <laughs> I knew then I'd get to tell the story sometime, so <laughs> it was kind of fun. How many of you went through the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989? My wife and I were in the seventh floor of a high-rise building in San Francisco, and it swayed this way, and it swayed that way. It didn't shake us up at all. <laughs> now, when we moved to the East Coast, we experienced a, an earthquake out there. When was that? In, in 2010, there was an earthquake in Virginia, I think, and it affected Washington, D.C. It damaged the National Cathedral. It damaged the Washington Monument, some other things. It was a pretty significant earthquake on the East Coast. And people are not used to earthquakes. And so this earthquake happened. It started rattling everything. Loretta was in one part of the building. I was in another didn't bother either one of us. We just kind of kept on doing what we were doing. Meanwhile, everybody's running around like Chicken Little. And they asked my wife, they said, how can you be so cool, calm, and collected? Aren't you, aren't you worried? She said, I'm from California. Okay, that settles it, right? <laughs> but about a year later, they had Hurricane Sandy come through there, and guess who got excited? Mrs. Huggins over here. We're used to earthquakes on the West Coast. We're just not used to hurricanes on the West Coast. And so she's running around, what do we do? And the East Coast people are like, it's no big deal. <laughs> well, I'm kind of that way, come what may. It just ain't no big deal. In the cosmic scheme of things, it's just not that big of a deal. War, famine, sickness, no one wants to see these tragedies happen, but it's not the end of your faith. It's not the end 
of Jesus in your life. In fact, you need him more during those times of tests and trials and tribulation. Praise God, let's put our faith in Jesus, not in horses or in men. Let's know, know who we are and what we have because we're born again. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and wave them around to Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm not going to be shook up. I'm not going to be dismayed. I've got my faith in Jesus and that's where it's going to stay. <laughs> I'm not shook up by television, the internet, or the news. I'm not shook up by anyone, not even by you. <laughs> I've got my faith in Jesus as much as I can. I'm going to put my trust in Him. How about you? Praise God. Let's just surrender to Him and His will in our lives. Let's just give it over to Jesus right now. We're not going to change anything by worrying about it. We're not going to change anything by losing our cool. We're not going to change anything by running around, freaking out like some fool. If you want to be a blessing to your family, then portray confidence. Tell them, say, it's going to be okay. Well, how do you know it's going to be okay? It's going to be okay. I promise you it's going to be okay. It's going to pass. No matter what you're going through, you're going to get through it. And you'll be no worse for the wear. You're going to be stronger and better and wiser. And God's got things in store for you. It's going to be okay. No matter what you're going through, you know, sometimes people have a death in the family and it seems like the end of everything. It's really not. You know, Jesus' attitude was, let the dead bury the dead, come and follow me. That seems kind of hard-hearted. But God is the God of the living, not of the dead. In other words, life goes on. Dealing with death is a part of living. Mortality is part of the human experience. Sickness. We see it all around us. A catastrophic sickness in a family can tear families apart and destroy people's faith. But if your faith is really in Jesus, it's not going to damage your faith. We don't want to go through sickness. We don't want our loved ones to be sick. But it's not going to cause the world to end. And it does not make God's word untrue. Divorce has to be worse than death. Seriously. Divorce has to be worse than death. You know, why would you say that, preacher? Well, when people die, you can have a good cry. You can go to the graveside, throw some dirt on top of them, say a few prayers, go have barbecue and potato salad, get on with your life. But divorce is like a train wreck. It just keeps happening. You start losing friends, maybe lose your job, uh, your emotions up and down, and when you think you're, you're through with it, then something else hits you. A lawsuit, animosity, things flare up for years. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ. Close your eyes and lift your hands towards heaven. All right, I'm going to minister to you by the Spirit. You're going to get through this. It's going to pass. I hope it's sooner than later, but nevertheless, it will pass. And when the smoke clears, you're going to be standing strong in the Lord, unwavering in your faith. It's not going to shake you up. It's not going to cause you to forget Jesus or walk away from your faith. You're going to make it in Jesus' name. Praise God. Hallelujah. You can give the Lord a hand clap for that word. Praise God. May I be really forthright with you tonight?
I don't mean to embarrass anyone, but I want to minister to people who have been through some hurtful separations and divorce. Notice I said separations. Maybe you haven't even legally dissolved the marriage contract, but emotionally, sexually, physically, you're separated. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here tonight and you are not yet healed from that separation divorce, if you're here tonight, you're still dealing with issues and problems are still showing up. Maybe it's been years, but that train wreck is still happening. The Lord wants to minister to you. You say, that's me, Brother Huggins. Let me see your hand. I want to minister to you by the Spirit. Yes, 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 yes. The Holy Spirit knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Praise God. All right, everyone with your hand up, I want you to come down here to the front and stand here in the presence of the Lord. The rest of you can be seated, but I want you to keep your switch of faith turned on. I want you to pray for these people the same way you'd want someone to pray for you. Remember, the Bible says, pray for one another that ye might be healed. So you and the congregation, stretch your hands out, stretch your hearts out, and pray your, ba your best prayer. You're gonna make it. You don't have to fake it. Just reach out and take it. You're not just going to survive. You're going to thrive because your faith is alive in Jesus' name. Right now, God is pouring in the oil and the wine. He's healing your soul by His Spirit divine. And everything is going to change in Jesus' name. We have to put our faith in Christ. I've admired you because I know you've been going through stuff. You've told me a little, but you always show up at the house of God. You always submit yourself to the Spirit of God, and that's what's gonna get you through. That's it. There really are no shortcuts. It's just being constant, consistent. Good job, stretch your hands out here. Father, we thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus. Friends come and go, even close relationships come and go. But Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. We can put our trust in him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your faith firmly and squarely planted on Jesus. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it in grand and glorious style. You're going to make it. Every mile, you're going to make it. Wearing a smile, you're going to make it. It's true, because Jesus is the foundation under you. You're going to make it. It's all fresh for you. You're bleeding right now. <laughs> but Jesus is going to stop the bleeding. Praise the Lord. Remember, his heart was broken for you. He bled for you. He went to the cross for you. He was betrayed. He was rejected. People turned their faces. They mocked. They scoffed. They laughed. They cursed. But he never swayed from his Father's will and the plan that God has for you and me. Put your trust on Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. Yeah, he brought you here tonight to just mend your heart. Stop the bleeding. You're going to make it. Listen, that is a word that you need to get in your spirit. You're going to make it. If you don't listen to another word I say, if you don't remember another word, remember this, you're going to make it. I'm telling you, I hope you, your, your, your marriage doesn't end in divorce, but... There is life after divorce. If it comes to that, your life is going to go on. Your life is going to continue. You're a person of quality. Jesus loves you. He values you. He has not forsaken you. He is with you. He's renewing you. He's giving strength to you. And he's going to get you through. Father, I pray that you will bless Rachel and just make her strong in the Lord and the power of your might. Give her the inner strength that she needs to walk this out. And I know you're going to walk it out with her 
in Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Praise God, hallelujah. Blessed be the Lamb of God. Son, don't ever get your eyes off of Jesus. We put our eyes on people, and sometimes people disappoint us. Sometimes our, our parents disappoint us. Sometimes uh, our family members disappoint us. But Jesus will never disappoint you. And as long as you have your eyes on him, you won't be shaken. As long as your eyes are on Jesus, you're going to make it. As long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, you've got a foundation under you, a foundation that's solid and strong and true. And that's where you need to put your trust. If you're totally, if you and I are totally trusting in Jesus, then the only way we can fail is for Jesus to fail. And he's not going to fail. He can't fail. That's why the Bible says we're more than conquerors through Christ. Yeah. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. Sometimes we put our trust in men. We're supposed to love men, but God never told us to trust men. We need to trust God. We need to trust his word, and we need to love people. I love you, but that doesn't mean that I absolutely 100% trust you. I don't even absolutely 100% trust me because I know about the time I'm starting to think that I'm infallible, I'm going to do something stupid. So I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm not going to look to people. I'm not going to look to circumstance. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to keep my trust in Him. Aren't you glad you came here from Fresno? Bless you. You know, to look at you, I would think... You don't have a care in the world, but I know you do. I know you're deeply hurt and deeply wounded, and it's fresh. You're going through it right now. And there's probably so much going on in your head and in your soul that it's hard to focus. But hear me again, you're going to make it. 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 Everybody say, I'm going to make it. Say it again. I'm going to make it. 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 I don't have to fake it because I'm going to make it. Hallelujah. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up on God. I'm not going to give up on church. I'm not going to give up on His Word. I'm not going to give up on praying and believing and giving and sharing and working. I'm not going to give up. What would you give up to? I mean, if, if you really wanted to get bad in your life, give up. Because the enemy will swoop in and take advantage of your situation. And that's when you really know hell when you give up. Never give up. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We talked about divorce, but I want to minister to someone in specifically here, and this is a word of knowledge. You had someone you really admired and really trusted who disappointed you so severely that it rattled you. You've been just in a state of bewilderness. How could this happen? How could this happen? How could you not see this? How did you allow it to happen? Maybe you've even beat up yourself over it. But all of us, sooner or later, are going to be betrayed. And the Bible says, the wounds of a brother or a friend are grievous. It's a big deal when a friend hurts you. It's a big deal when someone you love betrays you. I'm not talking about divorce here. That is betrayal and that is hurt, but I'm talking to someone else. Maybe it's a financial situation. I don't know, or a promise that was made. If you, by the upraised hand, say, Brother Larry, I believe you're talking about me. I want to minister to you and to you. Would you come up here, please? The Bible says 
make straight paths for our feet. Don't turn aside, but rather come and be healed. One of the reasons we ask people to come up here is because once you get out of your seat and you start walking towards the front, you're really in a figure closing the gap between you and Jesus. You're approaching Jesus. You're seeking Jesus. All I am is his uh, co-worker up here. But it's really Jesus who has the answers for you. And it's only Jesus who can mend a broken heart. He is the mender of broken hearts. And the Bible says a wounded spirit who can bear it. Let me tell you something. You can have major bones broken in your body, get healed and be better, no worse for the wear. Maybe stronger. But a wounded spirit can keep hurting for years. And if you don't do something about it, if you don't let Jesus heal you, it'll get more complicated and it'll begin to affect other areas of your life. Depression, lack of concentration, maybe cost you more relationships, cost you a job. You see people who are medicated all over the place because they just can't cope. We can cope if we'll put our hope in Jesus. That's where your faith is. Yeah, you've never given up on Jesus. You know what's what. You know the difference. Yeah, yeah, it's disappointing to lose confidence in someone. It's disappointing. But your hope is in Jesus. I know you. I know your faith. Put your trust in Jesus. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. He's the friend who will never depart from your life. Others might say or do things that are harmful, but Jesus will only do what's good and best for you. Your faith is in him. It's not in people. Your faith isn't in people. It's in Jesus. People are going to do what people do. And that is inevitable. That's the world in which we live. But your faith is in Jesus. <laughs> Unshakable, immovable. You can pass through the fire and the flames won't burn you because you're made out of the real stuff. <laughs> Gold and silver and jewels. You know, in a way, these challenges are may have some benefit. I don't think God tests us with these kind of temptations, but sometimes our faith is tried by fire. And it's not a bad thing to get rid of the dross and get rid of the chaff and let it get burned up and blown away. Because that means the precious jewels and gold and silver will be stronger and shine with the glory of God divine. Hallelujah. You're going you're gonna to be better than you were. You believe it? I believe it. Let me hear you say, I believe it. I believe it. I believe it too. Give these dear hearts a hand clap of love. All righty. Well, how many of you got something out of tonight's message? Good. I'm going to say this in closing. It's kind of a reiteration. There's no other foundation that can be laid other, Jesus, other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And what Paul meant by that is getting this revelation of Christ in you firmly built into your life. You will be unshakable to the extent you've owned this revelation for yourself. I wish I could just inoculate people with it like a you know vaccine, there you got it. That's not how it works. You have to renew your mind. You have to renew your mind. It's by rote and repetition. Get a hold of those scriptures. I can do all things through Christ. I'm complete in him. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus. And memorize those in him scriptures. Underline them in your Bible. Sing about it. Pray about it. And after a while, that will become part of your soul, part of who you are. You will actually become transformed 
where it's not just something that intellectually you agree with, but I mean it is your core belief. And when you're tested, then you're not going to be disappointed because it's not just a good idea. It's the real deal. I am a new creature in Christ. I can do all things through Christ. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus. I am complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And maybe you can get this kind of concentrated, specialized teaching a lot of different places. I don't know. You hear less and less about it as days go on, but you can get it here every Saturday night. As long as I'm breathing air, you can come here and I'm going to pump you up. Praise God. I promise you that. I, as a wise master builder, every time you come, I'm going to do something to get that foundation stronger under you. And then God is going to build us together as a habitation where miracles and glory and power will manifest every time we assemble ourselves. Amen. Praise God. There's a method to this. All right, do you have something good for us? All right, let me talk about Manuel before we get started. I could talk about all these people up here because they're all uh, just extraordinary, have servants' hearts, you know. John, John is in the choir, he's in the band, he practices on Thursday, he's here every Sunday night and running rehearsals for this group. But Manuel, did you see that, that, that cool video with, uh, with Matthew Swack where he's on all the cameras and he's, wasn't that cool? That was so creative. Well, let me tell you something, that is Manuel. He's, he jumps on the piano, he goes back there, he gets on the soundboard, you know, he turns on the lights, he runs around here, he gets the mic for Sister Loretta, he jumps back up on the piano. He is like the Holy Spirit. He is everywhere you need him to be. Just tell him you love him. Praise God. <laughs> but wouldn't it be good if you had some helpers? Wouldn't be a bad deal to have some helpers. And let me tell you something, we need helpers around here too at Summit. We can use a few extra hands around here. So um, call the office, put your name in, sign up online and tell them that you wanna, you wanna help at Summit. Somebody will pay you a call and get you plugged in, maybe a greeter, an usher. Um, we could use some greeters out here. A lot of times I walk in the door and uh, I, everybody that comes in ought to be hit by two or three people that are you know, just uh, putting some sloppy agape on them. <laughs> Holy hugs. Oh, no, I know it. I, I just, I'm, I'm remiss if I don't name everybody because we have a great, great crew around here and we love and appreciate all of our helpers. And then we have some secret agents here that you might not know about, but there are some intercessors who get here early and pray all during the service and they might be sitting right beside you. They're kind of undercover agents around here. They don't go off, uh, you know, tooting their own horn, but they are here. And one of the reasons we have such freedom and liberty here is because of these intercessors. All righty. You got something good? All right, let's all stand up. This is our dismissal song. Be friendly on your way out. Shake hands.